We continue to look this Lent at the subject of Sabbath, and our New Testament reading this morning is from Romans chapter 5. Let us listen together for God's Word. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Loving God, we know suffering well. We don't always know endurance. We certainly seek character. And we need hope. We pray by your spirit you would speak to us. You would grant us these gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we live in a very busy world. There's a lot going on around us at any given point. Thankfully, it's become very easy to do a lot of things at once. If I take these and put them in my ears, and I can listen to music, and I can talk on the phone at the same time, and without taking my hand off the wheel, I can look at directions on my phone. Well, hopefully I'm not driving while I'm doing all of this. I'm sure you've seen that before, though. This is, this is the world we live in, right? We have so many stimuli coming at us and so many ways to engage multiple stimuli at once. In fact, this is a relatively recent phenomenon, as you might imagine, with uh, technology and and things that in, in recent years, cognitive psychologists have given this a name, and they call it continuous partial attention, that this describes more or less how we go about our day, how we walk through our lives with continuous partial attention. Attention, And it is exactly what it sounds like, continuously giving partial attention to the things around us, never really giving our full attention to the things that we need, perhaps to give more attention to, like driving. That's important. Uh, Continuous partial attention has a more helpful cousin that we know by the name of multitasking. Now, this, this term is very familiar to us. That you, the, the, uh, you know, it just means doing more things, uh, more than one thing at a time. It goes back to the 1960s to computer engineers who designed processors that were capable of handling two tasks at the same time. But quickly, that term, which began in computer science, <laughs> bled over into human experience and human behavior because it, it was seen quite naturally to capture the way that we function in in an increasingly busy world with increasingly busy lives. We need to multitask to get things done. We need to multitask to stay on top of all of the things that we have on our plate. It's become the norm to multitask to the point where if you are not multitasking, you're probably not working hard enough. You probably need to work a little bit harder. Certainly there are drawbacks to multitasking. We know that when our attention is divided, we don't give certain things the attention that they deserve. But for the most part, we understand it to be a good thing. It's oriented toward productivity, efficiency. These are good things. But multitasking is such a part of our lives, we don't usually realize when we're doing it. And it has become so common, so normal, so typical for us, that it has become very difficult for us to see the ways that Multitasking can poison our understanding of time. Now, time is something we've been talking a lot about as we've looked at this subject of Sabbath. Just in time for Lent, I discovered an app on my phone that uh, does what most of us do not want an app to do, and that is it keeps track of how much time I spend on my phone. And not just the, the number of minutes in a day, but the number of times that I pick up my phone in a day. So at the end of the day, and if I, if I get, get too high, it starts to tell me, you've spent 45 minutes, you've spent 60 minutes on your phone today. It kind of nags you. But at the end of the day, you look and you can see how many minutes and how many times you've picked it up. And what, what really surprised me was the number of times I pick up my phone. 
It, it, it more than doubles the number of minutes that I spend on my phone, which means that most of the time I'm picking it up and probably doing nothing with it. Maybe I'm just looking at something, checking the time, checking a, a notification, an email, a text, or, or this or that that might take five or ten seconds. But if you carry a phone, a smartphone with you, perhaps you've had the experience where you're standing with nothing to do, and so without even thinking your hand is reaching for that phone, you're not sure why. You look at it, then you put it down. You're not sure what you just looked at. You're not sure why you picked it up in the first place. I'm describing myself here. I'm hoping that there's some <laughs> sympathy in the room for me. Um, there's an, I have an instinctive craving to be productive, right? To be efficient, to make good use of my time, because I don't want to waste Time. Now that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Wasting time. That's one that we use quite a lot, isn't it? We'll come back to that. But, but when, we, when we say we we're wasting time, usually it means we're not being productive, right? When we're wasting time, we're not using it well. We're not using it to get as much done as we could. We're not being productive. We'll come back to wasting time. But back to multitasking. There is a, a, a significant consequence of our innate tendency to multitask, and that is that no time in our lives is sacred anymore. No time is sacred. There are no moments when we open ourselves up to being able to accomplish many things at once. There are no longer moments that are protected from the interruptions of anxiety or our need to accomplish things or those persistent and nagging phone notifications, when we open ourselves up to this, this incessant multitasking, there is no moment in our lives that is safe. There is no time anymore that is sacred, that is protected from the encroachment of work. However you want to define work, I don't just mean what you do from 9 to 5 during the day, the work, the things, the busyness, the things that occupy us. Time is no longer sacred. This is not just a 21st century problem either. The phone notifications, that's a 21st century problem. But the rest of it is a very ancient problem. It goes all the way back even to the beginning of the people of Israel. Remember, they had been given this commandment at Sinai, the fourth commandment which we read together this morning. Just a few hundred, later, hundred years later, we come to the prophet Amos, one of the earliest Old Testament prophets. And this is what he says. He says, hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain? And when will the Sabbath be over so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the ephah small and the shekel great and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. Did you catch that part about the Sabbath? When will the Sabbath be over so that we may offer wheat for sale? They're observing the Sabbath, right? They've carved out the Sabbath day. But they can't wait for it to be over so they can resume their practices, so they can get back to commerce and to their work and to the economy and all of these important things in life. They are bleeding back into the Sabbath. It's a sort of ancient multitasking, not able to protect that time from the encroachment of work. The day of rest has been poisoned. The people are multitasking, observing the legalities of the Sabbath, but not really keeping it. In fact, they're keeping it, but they're not remembering it. They're not taking it seriously. They're not giving it the effort that it deserves. And so even for Israel long ago, the social and the economic pressure against Remembering Sabbath was very real, very significant. Which brings me to Romans. Paul writes that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us. These are probably my favorite words of Paul's about suffering. They, they may sound a little paternalistic about our suffering, a little bit dismissive. You may be suffering, but don't worry, it builds character. This is what my dad said to me growing up. Son, it builds character. I can't tell you how many times I heard that, and I'm just waiting for the moment when that comes out of my mouth to my own son. <laughs> but Paul is not really focusing here on suffering. 
what he's really focusing on is hope. Paul is tracing the pathway to hope, to real hope, to the foundational hope of the gospel. And that hope begins with suffering. Which is good to keep in mind when we think about the Sabbath. And when we talk about what that means for our lives. Because keeping the Sabbath, remembering the Sabbath, is not easy. Remembering the Sabbath is a challenge. There are social and economic pressures against remembering the Sabbath today, just as there were in the beginning uh, of, of Israel's life as a people. Two weeks ago on Sunday, so I had just been here preaching a sermon about time uh, and Sabbath and how important all that is. And that evening, I was shoveling this really wet, awful snow from our driveway Thankfully, that was the last time um, that I have to shovel for the year, I think. Um, so I was out there in the evening. Uh, if it snows, don't blame me. It really was. <laughs> I don't write all this stuff down. Sometimes it just comes out. Um, so anyways, I was on the driveway, and I had my son out there with me, mostly to get him out of my wife's hair, but to give him a chance to kind of run around and play. So I'm shoveling, I'm shoveling, I'm shoveling, and he's playing. He's having a good old time, and, and, and I get maybe three or four rows from the end of the driveway. And I start to hear my own words echoing in my head from my sermon that morning. Um, that doesn't usually happen. It probably should happen more often than it does, that I should listen to my own words when I'm, when I'm preaching. But there I am shoveling, and I, and I, hear, my, I hear my own sermon over again in my head. And, and I drop my shovel there on the driveway, and my son and I go build an amazing snowman. This was a, an incredible snowman because the snow was so wet, it was perfect. And we, we built it right out in front of our living room window, facing with the face and all that, facing our house. And so for the next week, our kids got such joy in the morning of going to that window and seeing the snowman. And by the time it started to melt and the, the facial features fell off, my daughter, my three-year-old, thought that it had turned around and was now facing the street because <laughs> it didn't have a, a face anymore. That snowman stood for me as a, a week-long reminder of what a moment of Sabbath is capable of doing. One of the things I never do is stop something, stop a task midway through. I can't stand stopping a task before it's done. If I'm working on something on the house and I'm one screw short, I will drop everything and go to the hardware store. I will buy that screw, doggone it, and I'm going to finish that job. It was, it was uh, completely against my nature to stop shuffling that. I did finish it after we built the snowman. <laughs> but it was completely against my nature. And I saw, for me, what a moment of Sabbath was capable of. Now, that cost me nothing to do that. It cost me nothing to drop the shovel and to play with my son and to build a snowman. It was a wonderful time. It cost me nothing. I was able to finish the driveway. There were no consequences of that except the positive ones, but that will not always be the case. When it comes to remembering the Sabbath in our lives in this busy 21st century, it will not always be the case that it costs us nothing to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. There will be consequences. Whether it's failed expectations or missed deadlines, there will be consequences. There will be suffering as a result of our decision to remember the Sabbath. The famous book, In His Steps, was written back in the early 20th century by Charles Sheldon. It's the book that gave us that WWJD, What Would Jesus Do? The, the, the uh, plot of the book revolves around a group of Christians deciding to reorient their lives around that question. What would Jesus do? And one of the main characters in that story is a newspaper publisher. And he decides in response to that question no longer to publish the newspaper on Sundays. So this was naturally a decision that resulted in suffering for him. There are certain companies with Christian corporate leadership today that make similar decisions. Hobby Lobby and Chick-fil-A are not open on Sundays. A decision that surely has uh, measurable, significant consequences for them. In the early 20th century, Christians in the United States argued and fought to prevent the mail from being, being delivered on Sundays. Did you know that until that time, the mail was delivered seven days a week? But that came to an end, and that was understood to be a victory for Sabbath, a victory for Christians in America. But you take all this together, and, and you rec we recognize that what it's doing is, is sort of going back to this 
problem that Amos was calling out the Israelites about uh, almost 3,000 years ago, saying, you're observing the Sabbath, you're recognizing this day, you're carving out the boundaries around it, but things are creeping in because it's not just about a day. It's not just about a 24-hour period, and, and more so now in the 21st century, how many of us are able to, to carve out a full 24-hour period to a complete stoppage of work and all of that and still survive and make a living? And it, it's just, it seems impossible. But to focus on Sabbath as the act of carving out that day and observing it legalistically is, is missing what Scripture is telling us about Sabbath, it's missing what Scripture is telling us about the God who commands Sabbath, who commands that we rest, that we observe, that we remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. For most of us, Sabbath does not equate to taking a full day. Instead, it equates more to many small decisions along the way. That snowman was probably the only real Sabbath decision that I can take credit for and really put under my belt. I felt good about it, but I don't do it very often. But Sabbath, the act of remembering the Sabbath and keeping it holy, is an act of many small decisions on Sunday or on Saturday or on Tuesday or any time. Any time. Decisions to stop multitasking, to stop letting the work and the busyness and the chaos bleed in to our rest. Decisions that lead us into a deeper appreciation of time itself. Decisions that draw us into fuller love of God and neighbor. If we look back again at that passage from Amos, we can ask the question, what is the consequence of not remembering Sabbath? What is the consequence for the people of Israel, of neglecting the true significance that, that lies behind the command of Sabbath. And Amos tells us, he says, that they are buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. That selling the sweepings of the wheat is, is profiting from the, the, the extra, the leftovers. And throughout the Old Testament law, it's clear that the extras, whether it's the sweepings of the wheat, the corners of your field, the gleanings from the harvest, these are to be left for the poor. These are how the poor and the stranger are deep to be provided for. And here they are profiting from them. They're profiting from the poor. This is the consequence of Sabbath, for the, of, of neglecting Sabbath. For the people of Israel, it is neglecting the neighbor. Walter Brueggemann is an Old Testament scholar, and he writes this about the people of Israel with respect to Sabbath. He says, Moses anticipates that if Israel is not alert to the God of emancipation, they will end up right back in another system of coercion. Because the land is fertile, its produce will make Israel safe and happy and if Israel can increase its produce, it will be safer and happier. And Israel will discover that the sky is the limit. The fertility of the land and the productivity of the system will make Israel acquisitive. Israel will come to think that the goal of its life is to acquire and to acquire and to acquire. And in order to acquire, Israelites must compete with the neighbor. The system will turn one's neighbor into a competitor and a threat and a challenge. Moses warns Israel to watch out. Or the land in its productivity will transform the Israelites into producers and consumers and will destroy the fabric of the covenantal neighborhood. What's amazing to me as I read this is that you could change out the word Israel for America and I feel like it would pretty well capture our society. I'll be the first to support a capitalist economy. But we have to recognize the dangers inherent in a productive system. A system that tempts us into thinking that it's all about productivity. Because a system like that changes the way that we view our neighbor. Our continuous partial attention. Our multitasking as we go throughout this life can so easily fool us into thinking that life is actually about productivity, about activity, about busyness and business, about these things. But to remember the Sabbath is to break with the norm. 
It is to swim upstream. It is to challenge the assumptions upon which our society are founded, is founded. So we worry about wasting time, but perhaps time is wasting us. Is a good use of our time being more productive, being more efficient, getting more accomplished? Is it just hard work? Is that what a good use of time is? God gives Israel a different understanding of time. God gives us a different understanding of time. Brueggemann goes on to say that Sabbath gives Israel a peculiar identity. A peculiar identity. It sets them apart. Sabbath, he writes, becomes a decisive, concrete, visible way of opting for and aligning with the God of rest. It's a decision that we make. It's many, many little decisions that we make that align us with the God of rest. Not the God of the system of Egypt that enslaved the Israelites, but the God of emancipation that set them free. Not the God of power, but the God of love. It's a decision that aligns us with the God of rest. And we maintain this peculiar identity by being willing to sacrifice productivity for the sake of loving our neighbor. A decision that surely will bring suffering. We'll suffer for it. We'll miss deadlines. We'll fail expectations. But our hope is not in ourselves. Our hope is not in what we're capable of, what we can accomplish, how many tasks in a given time period we can do. It is not in that that our hope is founded. Our hope is founded in the God of rest. The God of the seventh Sabbath day. The God who wasted time for us so that we can waste time for others. Let us pray. God, as we seek to understand what Sabbath really means, we pray that you would help us to remember to keep it holy. To see those moments in our lives that are opportunities to cherish what you have given us. Whether it be things or people or opportunities. or Simply a chance to rest. May we see these opportunities. May they lead us into deeper love of you and deeper, more compassionate love of our neighbor. In Jesus' name we pray.